the intent for today's call is, is really just uh, an overview or introduction on the React Native SDK that was released into Open Alpha um, yesterday. Uh, so it's now available for anyone to, to use. And I think a good place to start maybe is just some background on yeah why we decided to to build in React Native support, um, what the demand was that we were seeing. Yeah, I think you know our our long term vision with PowerSync is to be platform agnostic, both on the kind of on the back end and on the client side. You know, um, we kind of regularly speak to customers who um, are switching from. Postgres to MySQL, let's say, like their entire company, they're switching. And, you know, if, they, if, if they're if they a PowerSync customer, we don't want PowerSync to be like a limiting factor in decisions like that. Um, you know, it, they can carry on using PowerSync. So um, I think one of the reasons we decided to build React Native was just it fits, it fits in with our cross-platform kind of uh, philosophy and that, you know, on the client side as well, you know, whether you're using... Flutter or React Native or Web, like you can use PowerSync, it's going to be compatible. So I think that was like the, the first reason we decided to do it was that it fits in with our product vision. Um, yeah. And then we also, like within a couple of weeks after launching our Flutter SDK, we saw a ton of demand um, for React Native. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think um, like, to, like people on, on Twitter, um, people on on our Discord, people on other Discords. Um, I think we had some people emailing us, you know, so um, we, we, we saw like a lot of, a lot of um, requests for React Native from, from people. And um, that, that was the other reason why we decided to build it was just because people wanted it. Yeah. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of uh, chatter around React Native. Um, and yeah, I know there are some happy Developers out there uh, playing around with the alpha, so that's that's great to see. Okay, um, yeah, so maybe we can get into kind of what went into building this SDK and yeah, what was the approach that we used? Ooh, I can definitely talk about that from building the SDK. Uh, so our goal was to make the PowerSync client available to React Native and essentially JavaScript because that's the language that's mostly written into. So we set upon building this SDK, and let me just give you a quick overview of the kind of general structure of what we've shared before. Our goal is to have it usable in React Native, and React Native uses React. Uh, React common design approach is to use hooks for um, getting updates of data as things change. So we wanted to provide that kind of functionality of accessing the PowerSync data getting the latest changes from the stream, from updates that are remotely streamed in real time, and to uh, mutate the database and make sure that those changes get synced back up as well. So we ended up, from the top level down, creating React, 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 React hooks, but that requires a JavaScript client, because that's the main language which this whole platform is based upon. And in order to interface with JavaScript with our SQLite functionality, which is, is what actually stores the database on the phone, we decided to go with JSI bindings, which, um, which interface with a C implementation of SQLite, which is directly linked to our PowerSync Rust SQLite extension. And that extension does most of the functionality for ensuring that the syncing operations are, are done between the device and the server. So to kind of break up how we built it, we kind of really started from the lower level down and worked our way up, uh, getting the, the most complicated native implementations sorted out and then providing the nice user interface for the SDK, which the clients will be using. Uh, so I'll start from the bottom. So the PowerSync Rust SQLite extension, uh, that's the, the most important part of it, essentially. Um, it does all the syncing on the actual database, it provides uh, some abstraction by using virtual tables. So whenever you modify a row or a column in your table, you can track those changes and queue them for, like, for, the, for your CRUD operations when you sync them back to your server. It validates the sync checkpoints, which when, when we receive data from the stream, it, uh, it also applies updates from the stream on the PowerSync instance whenever we receive them to make sure that both databases are in sync. So we needed to load this into a SQLite um, implementation on the device for the SDK. 
And we found a good implementation of SQLite for React Native was the React Native Quick SQLite library. It's a very performant version of SQLite, which uh, uses the JSI bindings to, in a very performant way, allow access to those native SQLite functionalities from JavaScript so in the React Native environment. So we forked that uh, module so that we could automatically load our PowerSync uh, Rust SQLite extension into that. And any DB connection that we create thereafter will automatically use the extension to ensure all the, the background syncing functionality is implemented. Uh, so once we had these JSR bindings and a nice connection to a SQLite database, we could really start implementing the, the JavaScript side of things, which is kind of the intermediate layer between the SQLite database and the, the, the PowerSync server and what the user will use in their application. So the, uh, the, the JavaScript side of the SDK really it connects to the PowerSync um, instance server, and then it relays any event updates to the database connection and the SQLite extension to apply those changes to the, to the database on the device. And then it also allows you to ask the extension for your CRUD updates that you need to apply on your business logic and your upload server um, handling routines. And it also allows you to control and it provides locks for transactions and, and writing to the database in the right uh, sequence and ordered manner so that everything is consistent and synced up with everything. And it also provides a pretty cool feature, which is the watched queries. Uh, so whenever anything changes in the database, we get those events from the connection and we can rerun the queries and make sure that you automatically have updated data real-time streaming to your application. Uh, yeah, so this is basically the interface of, of what that JavaScript client exposes. It's just a way to connect to the server, a way to get those um, uploads that you need to make from the local changes you've done on the device when you're being offline or online, just to ensure that your local changes are synced back up. And it also, behind the scenes, does the down syncing from the server. Uh, you, you get a direct uh, connection to the SQLite database with a bit of abstraction, but you can execute statements, you can make mutations, you can do queries, you can get um, results back from the database. Uh, we also offer uh, the transactions too, so you can do multiple changes to the database and either commit them all at once or roll them back all at once. And the, the basic implementation on the JavaScript level for watching those queries. Uh, you give it your query, your parameters, and as soon as that changes, you will get an iterable result with the latest data in it. Uh, so once we had the JavaScript side of things, we could start focusing on the React side of things. Uh, there's lots of, lots of different ways of approaching um, designing of apps and managing data and state in React. So we also really wanted to expose the JavaScript side first and then add extra methods of communicating with that. So for instance, we have our React hooks, which is just a very thin wrapper for the actual JavaScript um, PowerSync client. So you can initialize that client anywhere, put it in the context so that you can access it in low order components. And then you can use those internal hooks like uh, using a watched query, which if any of the lists change over here, the variable returned over here will automatically update so your widget can render the, each list that's updated in real time. But you're not, you're not really restricted and forced to use these hooks. You could use other methods too, like uh, we've used MobX in the one example app, which is a different method of managing state. But um, it's, it's kind of, uh, you're free to make your own decisions and use the way you like to do things. It's kind of like the general React paradigm as well, where React is just a library that lets you do things, but you can choose how to do it. So the PowerSync React Native SDK is focused on React, but it's also free to you to do whichever paradigm of React and state management you would like to choose. Right. Yeah. yeah thanks for that. That's super, super interesting. Um, Kobe, I don't know if you had any follow-up questions for Steven. I did. What um, I was wondering, those read lock and write lock methods on the interface, um, do you anticipate those to be things that developers would typically use? Um, what I've seen, you know, uh, users mostly use are 
you know, get, uh, get all, execute, watch. Um, those are kind of, and, you know, retransaction, write transaction. Um, maybe you could ex yes. talk a bit about those lock methods. Yes, uh, the lock methods are not as commonly used as the transactional ones. Um, it's more of a niche method, which does a very similar to effect as what the read and write transactions will do. It just doesn't actually start the SQLite transaction itself. So it just gives you the freedom of doing anything before or after that uh, SQLite transaction statements occur. OK. Um, yeah. It's not really something that would often be used. It's probably, but for the cases where it might be required, it is available. OK, cool. And, uh, and I know our, um, we released a, a demo app, um, which is, I think, a, one potential way for developers to get started um, is with a demo app. And the demo app uses Expo. Um, so we're, um, our, when you were building this, were um, the considerations to be compatible with Expo, um, were those considerations just ring fenced to the demo app, or, or were there some things in the design of the SDK itself to make sure it's compatible with Expo? Um, the reason for choosing Expo for the demo app was mostly for it's the simplest entry point into React Native. There's less configuration to set things up. It's easy to get yourself going and started. Uh, so the main focus was to make it compatible with that, since it's easier for developers to get into React Native with Expo. But at the same time, it is possible to eject an Expo app into a pure React Native application to give yourself some more fine granularity control over your application. So we do want it to be compatible with both of those methods. So it, the reason for choosing Expo was just for an ease of entry point and simplistic use case. Makes sense. Cool. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a good point to move to next, which is how can developers get started with, uh, with the SDK? And do you have any tips for them? And I guess this is to both of you. Sure, yeah, I suppose I it does say... depend on your learning style a bit, you know? Yeah, you can, mm -hmm. you can just start hacking it into your, your existing app, um, or you could you know, build a new app on your own and get started there, or get started with our demo app. Um, I think there is a bit of a choose your own adventure. Yeah, so this is the demo app. Um, you can find the SDK itself um, on NPM. Um, and yeah, um, the demo app is, is pretty straightforward. Um, clone it, follow the instructions, um, and you'll be up and running.